Hilda's third season is equivalent to a musical coda. This stanza is detached from the rest of the piece, but this concluding portion still shares some of the same notes and themes. Every single frame exudes charm, and the humor retains its whimsical sense of wit. At least your dad's not dragging you to a nutcracker swap meet. That's where nightmares are born. He's not wrong. The show's main storyline was resolved in Hilda and the Mountain King, but these final eight episodes still have plenty to say about change, identity, and of course, the nature of perspective. Whereas seasons one and two are about the ways we view the world, season three focuses on how we view ourselves. As we grow older, our capacity for empathy and understanding extends outward. This phenomenon is subtly demonstrated in the show's opening credits. With each new season, the final shot gets brighter and brighter, steadily progressing from night to dawn to dusk. As the sun shifts above Trollberg, so too does Hilda's perspective. Trollberg is just where I live now. <clears throat> the wilderness will always be my real home. Do you ever still miss the wilderness? Sometimes, not as much as I used to. Maturity develops when we internalize that broadened viewpoint and apply its lessons to our own patterns of behavior. And these final eight episodes all elaborate on this idea. In The Laughing Merman, Hilda, David, and Frida learn that their fellow Sparrow Scouts call them the freaky friends behind their backs. You lot are always getting caught up in some weird stuff. It's like you're allergic to normal. Desperate to prove otherwise, the trio tries to have a quote-unquote ordinary fishing trip, but their plan quickly falls apart when their new companion Louise hides the map. I love Louise. She's great. How dare the showrunners introduce such a great character right before the series finale? That should be illegal. I am a victim of a hate crime. That's not what a hate crime is. Well, I hated it! There's a pervasive undercurrent of horror throughout this season, but in my opinion, nothing is more terrifying than being held hostage by a theater kid. He's gonna eat us any second now. Even worse! He's putting on a show. This episode quickly became one of my favorites, thanks in no small part to its beautiful message. We like to think we're in control of how others perceive us, but that's just not the case. People will come to their own conclusions, and more often than not, those conclusions will be an inaccurate representation of who you truly are. It's extremely frustrating, but it's also liberating. You are the only person you're obligated to please. Authenticity is infinitely more valuable than a stranger's approval. Real connections come when you find someone who admires you and all of your quirks. There's no shame in being part of the Freaky Friends. If anything, the nickname should be worn like a badge of honor since these three literally saved Trollberg from total annihilation. But I digress. One Louise is worth more than a dozen glib Sparrow Scouts. It's just nice to know that someone appreciates our tendency to be, um, abnormal. Hilda's adventures with the Woodman are always a highlight, and Chapter 3 is no exception. The two travel to an alternate reality where giants haven't yet left Earth, but tensions are at an all-time high between the two species. Humans are ready to wage war against this fairly reluctant foe, and their general is a literal child who's blinded by his own sense of righteous indignation. Have you tried talking to the giants? I wasn't put on this Earth to talk. My destiny is to slay. Oh, sweetie. There's only one slayer, and her name is Buffy Summers. I'm gonna give you all a nice, Fun, normal evening, if I have to kill every single person on the face of the earth to do it. The Giant Slayer is a perfect foil for Hilda. She too is an advocate for justice, but Hilda's good deeds rarely ever benefit her. She helps other creatures because it's the right thing to do, not because she expects her actions to result in fame or glory. Halvor claims to be a champion for all of humanity, but his fury is ultimately a self-serving quest for revenge. A giant stepped on both of their houses, but Hilda saw the event for what it was, a display of casual indifference. Halvor viewed it as a malicious attack. No one steps on a house by accident. We do it every day. We don't even realize. Maybe you do, but I would notice if I did that kind of damage. Did you mean to do all of this? We're not always cognizant of the harm we're capable of inflicting. But acknowledging our capacity for destruction allows us to develop a deeper sense of empathy for our peers and ourselves. Odds are you've unintentionally hurt someone before. This doesn't make you a bad person, nor is it a reflection of your inner nature. People make mistakes, and that's okay. Maturity is not the absence of faults. It's the willingness to address them. By admitting culpability and striving towards improvement, we can create a better world. 
a world where the word enemy becomes less and less common. Forgiveness is an act of compassion, and it's vital to the process of healing. When we extend grace to other people, we're also extending grace to ourselves. I know this doesn't make up for what I've done, but do you think you could help me put out some of these fires? There's a respectable futility in Hilda's actions throughout this episode. She wants to prevent the giants from leaving again, but all her pleas fall on deaf ears. I wish there was something I could do to help. There is nothing you could do. You are just a little girl. The change she wants to enact doesn't come to pass, but she's still made an impact, one that can't be understated. Change takes time, and we're not always around to see the outcomes of our good deeds. A good deed that does reap tangible results is the lending library from Strange Frequencies. Our protagonists have long accepted the fact that their stuff can and will be taken by a neighboring Nyssa at any given moment. But Nyssa aren't familiar with being on the opposite end of this exchange. I guess now you know how it feels to have something stolen from you. Yeah, because somebody stole something from me. Such is an unfortunate roadblock for developing empathy. It's hard to sympathize with a situation until you become a fellow victim. Nyssa don't share, so they don't fully understand what it means to borrow something until they see this practice in action. So I can take anything I want? Yep, but you have to put it back when you're done. Herein lies a crucial realization we all had to learn whilst traversing the path to adulthood. We can't expect others to behave the same way we would. You know when you presume, you make a prayers out of you and me. There are countless communication pitfalls. Words are an insufficient means of expression, but they're also the best tool we have at our disposal. Active listening is a skill we have to cultivate. A single town hall meeting won't fix everyone's problems, but if we take the time to hear one another's complaints, then finding a solution becomes a much easier task. And to think it was all my idea. Huh, really? But I shared it with you. Uh? <laughs> but perhaps the most difficult realization for Hilda comes in Chapter 5, The Job. Such is the life of an adventurer. Such is the life! I never really cared to know the identity of Hilda's father. Sure, the topic was fascinating, but it wasn't a question that needed answering, especially since this series heavily focuses on the relationship between a mother and daughter. Anders is ultimately insignificant. So imagine my amusement when I first saw this scene. I'm sure she's told you how I follow the call of adventure wherever it takes me. To be honest, I sort of figured he died when she was a baby. <gasps> so did I! Anders isn't a bad guy. He's not great, but there are certainly worse animated father figures. Anders uses the term adventuring to excuse his absentee parenting. There's nothing inherently wrong with running free and feeling like nothing can hold you down, but when you have a kid, your life philosophy should be a tad more nuanced. He's also a terrible planner who doesn't keep a budget and rarely upholds his promises. In other words, he's Alpha's worst nightmare. <sighs> it's alright, Alpha. What about his reckless sense of time? Trust me, all the paperwork in the world won't fix that. Ironically enough, his disappearance at the end of this episode isn't his fault. But it's still an important catalyst for Hilda's development because she has to come to terms with her father's flaws. This is what he does when he feels overwhelmed. He runs away to his next adventure. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. He just has a hard time showing it. Anders strikes me as someone who never matured emotionally, and this stagnancy is reflected inside of his locket. It's a sweet picture of Hilda, but she's not a baby anymore. In fact, her childhood is coming to an end and Anders missed most of it. Growing up entails a long list of responsibilities, and one of those responsibilities is being there for your loved ones. But it's important to note that extraneous circumstances can make it quite difficult to fulfill that role. The train to Toffaton kickstarts a physical and interpersonal journey for our main characters, a journey that spans across several generations and dimensions. The linchpin in this overarching narrative is Great Aunt Astrid, one of Hilda's only blood relatives and the spiritual successor to the likes of Grunkle Stan and Ida the Owl Lady. Those three could swindle tourists for everything they're worth. Oh, now that I do mail orders, I can hardly keep up! Chapter 1 lulls us into a false sense of security. The stakes are relatively low and the emotional payoff is sweetly subdued. 
Hints have been sprinkled throughout the series that Hilda longs for a larger family. She loves her mother dearly, but that inner circle is still quite small. Hilda, you've always had family. Aww. Then chapter two comes along and hits us with some finely crafted nightmare fuel. Compared to the other fantastical creatures we've met, the fairies of Toffaton are sinister and borderline unnatural. They spy on and abduct people to sustain their population. There's nothing whimsical about that. It's just creepy. And it would be the creepiest aspect of season three if chapter six didn't exist. It's all fun and games until the deer fox starts crying. Once you peel back the layers of horror and intense dread, these episodes introduce some really interesting ideas and themes. This season primarily explores our perceived sense of self, but we can't truly understand ourselves if we don't know our full histories, and Joanna is missing a significant chunk of hers. We know her as a mother, and an artist, and a chainsaw-wielding badass, but those titles can't properly define her. People tend to fixate on labels. We use them to loosely craft an identity, but the resulting image will always be incomplete, and no one understands this better than the terrifying lake monster. I have no word for what I am. I just am. This heartwarming message is also a clever piece of foreshadowing, pun not intended. Andrew's disappearance is merely a plot device to get Hilda and Joanna inside the fairy mound for the series finale. Mother and daughter traverse this wild dimension together, though neither recognize each other as such. Despite Astrid's best efforts, Joanna reunites with her parents and the full truth of Hilda's family is revealed. I'm a fairy! I'm a fairy! Emphasis on the part, <laughs> Hilda. This joy is really short-lived, though, because there's no natural way to leave fairy country. According to Aunt Astrid, characters see everything through the haze of what fairy country thinks they want to see. This viewpoint is reminiscent of childhood, a time when your perception of the world was severely limited and shaped by other forces. The sun never sets in fairy country. Nothing changes. Nobody grows. It's an endless adventure, a dream you never have to wake from. To an adult who longs for childhood simplicity, it's paradise. To a child who deserves the chance to grow up, it's purgatory. If we stay here, this is it. Nothing will be new. This is everything there will ever be for us. Is that really so bad? Finium and Lydia are a loving memory, but that's all they are, a memory. They can't change, not in any meaningful way. Their picnic conversations are comprised solely of long forgotten stories that hold no significance for Hilda. She's always wanted a larger family, but a loving illusion isn't what she had in mind. And even though it's extremely painful to admit, Joanna knows that her daughter is right. I've regained my past, but I'm not going to rob you of your future. Our future. Fairy country looks perfect. If someone wants something, then the island provides it. But what we want isn't always what we need. Acknowledging this dissonance is an important part of growing up, but the island's inhabitants can only regress. They slowly forget their human lives. Their loved ones fade into a mere echo of remembrance. This level of decay is insidious at its core. Hilda desperately wants to confront it, but that distinction belongs to Astrid, someone who's truly experienced both worlds. The fairy entity speaks to her like a disapproving parent who's admonishing their wayward child. It's a manipulative tactic that's common in abusive relationships, to deny your victim any and all access to power. But these tricks don't work on Astrid because she never loses sight of her own agency. You have nothing to bargain with. I have one thing. My life. While she's bartering with this completely deranged entity, David, Frida, and Twig stage a rescue mission that can only be described as totally fucking epic. The deer foxes rush into battle, mother and daughter start flying, Avengers Endgame wishes it could be this cool. The double death fake out was a bit mean, but I completely forgive the showrunners for playing with my emotions because having Victoria Van Gale save the day is beyond satisfying. 
As for Astrid's fate... Banished forever. That's what you get for talking back to your elders, I suppose. God, I'm going to miss this show. It's an utterly delightful piece of media, and I'm so glad it ended on its own terms. That type of satisfaction is extremely rare these days. The final scene is a perfectly crafted curtain call. Hilda has helped so many people throughout this series, and it's quite gratifying to see the full extent of her impact. When she takes her seat next to the family she's chosen and cultivated, Hilda catches a glimpse of two shadows, proudly watching from afar as their daughter and granddaughter flourish. This video is brought to you by my patrons. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider pledging. I would deeply appreciate it. Also linked in the description is Edna St. Vincent Millay's full poem. Go read it. It's excellent. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. And until next month, take care.